Hi, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Danny Reed. I am uh, with the Holocaust Memorial in Miami Beach, and I want to thank you to uh, this event that we're having, uh, Women in the Holocaust, with uh, ho noted Holocaust scholar Carol Rittner. And um, this is part of a special series that we've been having over the last few months, and we're very pleased to have her and, uh, and Michael Birnbaum with us today. Um, Michael is a noted scholar in his own right and instrumental in the founding of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, as well as the Illinois Holocaust Museum, and has been instrumental in helping the memorial with a lot of our educational proje uh, projects as well. So I just want to uh, introduce Michael, and uh, he's going to be introducing our guest speaker for the day. Thank you very much, Danny. I have uh, over the years enjoyed working with the uh, Memorial in Miami Beach and uh, I appreciate all the work that you do, most especially the work that you do with uh, teachers and students. Uh, this is a very special pleasure um, to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Professor Carol Rittner, um, who is a long, t long friend of mine and also a source of um, of wonderful criticism over the years. Uh, I'm gonna take full and complete, uh, I'm saying this uh, tongue in cheek a little bit. I'm gonna take full and complete responsibility for one of the books that she edited with uh, one of my closest friends and one of my spiritual mentors, John Roth. John Roth and I in 1989 wrote a, a, a put together a book collection of essays called The Holocaust, Religious and Philosophical Implications. Carol read the book, said very nice things about the book, and then chastised us and beat us up, ter beat us up terribly and chastised us. And she said, where were the woman? And that is that we did not include in a sufficient way women's experience is part of the story of the Holocaust. Since she said it to John Roth and myself, and since John's solution to every problem is to write another book, always excellent books and important books, Carol and John put together a, an absolutely compelling work on uh, women and the Holocaust. And it is to this day, one of the most important uh, anthologies in the field that is useful, provocative, interesting, uh, unrelenting. And she, uh, together with John, are deeply and profoundly responsible uh, for making sure that any scholar who deals with the Holocaust deals with the role of women in the Holocaust. Consequently, when we shaped this program, and you know, you've been with us, I gave you a general introduction to the Holocaust. Uh, Peter Hayes spoke about uh, why, which was his major contribution. John Roth spoke about ethics of the Holocaust. Michael Basler spoke about um, um, the uh, legal implications of the Holocaust. We've gone, we've gone all over in dealing with this, but I know that one of the essential, and Richard Brightman spoke about FDR, and the Holocaust. I know that one of the essential components I could not get away without doing, would not get away without doing, and would not do because I've now internalized uh, 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 Dr. Rittner's, uh, I'm going to call her Carol, even though she's a religious sister of mercy. Uh, one of the things I've uh, done is to internalize her critique and will never grapple with the Holocaust without paying um, important service to the experience of women in the Holocaust. So I invited uh, Carol, who has been a professor at uh, Stockton University and who's made a significant contribution in a number of works. I've invited her to speak on women and the Holocaust, uh, which tells you that even I can learn something. Uh, <laughs> and even I, e even I can continue to grow and uh, it tells you also that sometimes the highest compliment you can give to another human being is to critique them. But critique them, uh, there's a, a very lovely word that a friend of mine says, make sure, uh, he said this about criticism of Israel, 
He said, I don't mind you criticize Israel, but criticize Israel as a mother, not as a mother-in-law. So <laughs> Carol did it with, uh, with, um, uh, with affection and esteem, but with a toughness and a strength. And I have always appreciated that toughness, that strength, that commitment, that uh, moral integrity and scholarly wisdom that has been associated with Carol throughout her career. So you don't, you are, you're not here to hear me, you're here to hear her. Professor, sister, Dr. Carol Whitehead. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, you practically took the whole half of my, of my talk by giving the introduction about the book, but thank you very much for uh, inviting me and thanks to the Miami uh, Holocaust Center for inviting me, to Danny for inviting me and to all of you for being part of this this afternoon. You know, originally I prepared my presentation for March thinking, oh great, March is a great month for me to give this talk because it's Women's History Month. And so I thought giving a talk about women and the Holocaust was really a very appropriate uh, topic. But alas, we had a mix up. So it was not March, but April was my assigned month. And that's even better. We just commemorated Yom HaShoah last week. And of course you all uh, who commemorate and celebrate Passover, just celebrated Passover. For me, it was uh, Easter. Uh, this past Sunday, April the 11th, we observed two anniversaries. Uh, the 76th anniversary, of the 6th Armor Division uh, of the U.S. Third Army's liberation of Buchenwald. And Sunday also marked, as you may know, the 60th anniversary of the start of the trial of Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem's district court in what was then the young state of Israel. And I don't want to forget that this evening begins Israel Memorial Day followed tomorrow evening with um, the beginning of Israel uh, Independence Day. So from my perspective, uh, April is a very good month to speak about women and the Holocaust. But before I get into my topic, let me share a few slides with you. Um, first of all, um, these are uh, some suggestions I have if you are uh, looking for more information about women uh, and the Holocaust. Here are four excellent sources. All you have to do is Google U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, which has wonderful um, exhibitions and photographs and essays and all sorts of things about women in the Holocaust. Yad Vashem, which I think has an absolutely sterling uh, website that is just filled with uh, very creative short videos. Um, it has essays, of course. It has um, survivor uh, testimony. The Shoah Foundation, which also uh, out at the University of Southern California, their website, you can find tons of material about uh, women and the Holocaust, including, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken the recording from a, um, a conference that was held, oh, maybe five or six or seven years ago on women in the Holocaust, which is excellent. And believe it or not, if you're not familiar with this, the UN Holocaust Outreach Program also has excellent resources, including a teacher's guide on uh, women and the Holocaust. Uh, now, I, I want to show you a few maps before I begin to get into my topic. This first map is, um, it gives you a general idea of Europe in 1933. And uh, of course, we all know that Hitler came to power in Germany in January of 1933, but you, you have a sense of the uh, kind of the international borders of Europe. Uh, the next map uh, is a map of Europe um, just pre-war, around the 1st of January, 1938. Again, you see the 
uh, you see Germany, Poland, Soviet Union, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I, I just want you to get a, kind of a sense of where we are here. Uh, the next um, slide is, um, this is a slide I actually got from the um, Imperial War Museum in London. And it shows, again, these are approximate numbers, but it shows you the approximate numbers of Jews in the various countries of, um, of Europe, particularly the countries that were going to eventually be invaded, conquered, occupied by Nazi Germany. And the fifth slide, now, when you look at this slide, this is Europe in 1942. 1942 was when, again, this is a slide from the Imperial War Museum in London. This slide shows you the extent of the dominance of Nazi Germany in Nazi occupied Europe. And if, if you look at it, you can recognize to the upper left corner, you see uh, Ireland over there on the left with Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom, you see Sweden, uh, the, these tan uh, maps are of unoccupied countries. You see down to the lower left, Spain and Portugal, and of course almost kind of uh, left of center in the map is Switzerland. But you can see that how powerful and dominant Nazi uh, Germany was. But the next slide, if we could take a look at that, this shows you uh, some of the major camps, including the death camps in uh, occupied Europe. So if you look closely at this, you see Auschwitz, Birkenau, Majdanek, Sobibor, if you look over to the left uh, in the map, you see Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald, as I mentioned, Sunday Buchenwald is where Elie Wiesel uh, was and was uh, freed from, from Buchenwald. Um, so again, just, just to give you a sense of, the, uh, of where the camps and the death camps were in occupied Europe. And now my last slide, again, this is, uh, from the Imperial War Museum, just a visualization um, in 1945, the end of the war, May of uh, 1945, the end of the war in Nazi occupied Europe. And you see the remaining Jews. Again, these are approximate numbers, but you see how devastated um, the Jewish community was uh, in Europe at the end of, uh, by the end of World War II and the Holocaust. So thank you, uh, Ari, for putting those slides up for me. Now, I want to make a few kind of preliminary comments uh, before I get into the whole topic of uh, women and the Holocaust. Hitler's core ideas can be summed up in the phrase race, and space. You saw the space. I was trying to visually show you how Nazi Germany, Hitler and Nazi Germany, how they expanded first eastward and then of course uh, westward as well. But the, the, his core ideas, race and space, at its core, the Nazi worldview was racist and biological. Hitler was obsessed with two notions that humanity was engaged in a gigantic struggle between races or two communities of blood and that pure Germans, members of the so-called Aryan race were the superior race of uh, human being. Their superiority granted these so-called Aryans the right and the obligation to rule over other races and peoples for the benefit of humankind. Now, what was an Aryan? Well, like all categories, all these racial, so-called racial categories, Aryan was an invention, a social construction, rather than a physical fact. Still, in Hitler's worldview, these so-called Aryans needed space to expand, living space, that Hitler called by its German term, Lebensraum. The Jews, in complete contrast to these so-called Aryans, 
were seen as a kind of anti-race, dangerous in human beings in seemingly human form. Another point in, in terms of Hitler's ideology. By the early 1920s, hatred of Jews was a fixed point in Hitler's ideology. He maintained until his death a fanatical antipathy to everything and anything he considered Jewish. There were political, social, cultural, and even metaphysical dimensions to his hatred of Jews and Judaism. Of course, Hitler's hostility included familiar social and economic resentments as well. He shared all the stereotypes of Jews, stereotypes like Jews as greedy bankers, legalistic pedants, lecherous males, and and seductive, destructive females. Jewish to him meant everything negative, the opposite of his so-called Aryan race. Hitler and the Nazis regarded Jewishness as a race, a biological fact that could not be altered by any change of religion, name, or habits. The sheer multidimensionality of Hitler's anti-Semitism gave it a kind of mass appeal. Many Germans could find something in it that they shared, even if they did not buy the whole package. Now, as we know, nearly 6 million Jews were murdered in Nazi German-occupied Europe by the Nazis and their collaborators during World War II and the Holocaust. Jews were, were murdered in the cities and the towns, in the countryside, in the forests in ghettos and in concentration and death camps. Millions of non-Jews were also caught in the Nazi law of death and destruction. As Elie Wiesel often used to say, not all victims of the Nazis were Jews, but all Jews were victims. The spark that set off the Holocaust was Adolf Hitler and his Nazi regime in Germany. They created a climate conducive to brutality, but without certain preconditions, for example, centuries of anti-Judaism in Christian theology, widespread anti-Semitism in society, eugenics and biased attitudes toward disabled people, prejudices against the Roma and the Sinti, and negative attitudes toward homosexuals, among others. Mass murder on such a scale would not have been possible. Now, as Michael Barenbaum has already mentioned, a number of years ago, John Roth and Michael edited and published a, a book about religious and philosophical implications of the Holocaust. John sent me a copy. At the time, I was the, um, the director of the Elie Wiesel Foundation in New York, Ellie had won the Nobel Peace Prize and he began a foundation and he asked me to be the head of it. And I was living in New York City at the time and I received this book from John Roth. And um, when he asked me what I thought about it, I said to him, I said, well, I think it's a great book, but where are the women? I knew there was a significant, there had been significant work done on the Holocaust by female scholars and survivors. I, I was thinking, for example, of, of scholars like, uh, for example, Hannah Arendt, whether you agree or disagree with her, her book is still an important book, her, her writing is still important. Charlotte Delbeau, for example, Sybil Milton, for example, Lucy Davidowitz, for example, Helen Fine, Dorothy Zola, the Protestant theologian, Pelagio Lewinska, Marion Kaplan and Gisela Pearl. Lewinsky and Gisela Pearl are, of course, uh, survivors of the Holocaust. And uh, among others, other females, other women who have done, who either wrote their memoirs or did scholarly work about, uh, about the Holocaust. And I was like, well, how come you haven't included any of these folks in this um, collection of significant and important essays about the Holocaust? I have been a teacher and a scholar of the Holocaust 
for more than 40 years. And I think it is no exaggeration to say that until well into the 1980s, even into the 1990s, Holocaust scholarship and Holocaust memory were shaped mostly by men, Victor Frankl, Primo Levi, Elie Wiesel, Raoul Hilberg, Yehuda Bauer, Franklin Littell, Saul Friedlander, Bruno Bettelheim, John Palakowski, Richard Rubenstein, one of Michael Berenbaum's mentors and, uh, and teachers, by Michael himself, by Robert J. Lipton, to name but a few of the many widely known male Holocaust scholars, writers, and survivors. I'm not suggesting there were no women speaking or writing about the Holocaust prior to the 1980s and 90s, only that the voices that seemed to dominate Holocaust scholarship and public discourse about the Holocaust were the voices of men. Their memoirs and scholarly volumes, think for example, Elie Wiesel's memoir, Night, or Primo, Le Le uh, Primo Levi's memoir, Sur Survival in Auschwitz, or Victor Frankl's memoir, Man's Search for Meaning, which personally on me had a huge impact. Not to mention Raoul Hilberg's three volumes, The Destruction of the European Jews, and the many, many books of Yehuda Bauer, including the Holocaust in historical perspective. These memoirs and scholarly studies in the years after 1945 had gained a wide audience. They were widely used and taught in schools and colleges and universities. They were widely discussed at conferences and in journals, and rightly so. But some of us began to ask whether their views and interpretations of history, that is the views of men, was that all there, there is? Is that all there is about the Holocaust? The views and interpretations of men. What about the views of women? Where were they? That's when John Roth and I, when I asked him the question and we discussed the book, we decided to try to find out where women were. And what we discovered was that women were everywhere during the Holocaust, as well as after the Holocaust. Women were reflecting on their experiences. They were telling their stories, trying to help the rest of us to come to terms with the horrors of the Nazi Third Reich and the Holocaust. We found that women were in ghettos and in hiding. They were in resistance units, concentration camps and killing centers. Women also were present in the Nazi sphere of influence. They were present as perpetrators. For example, take Wendy Lauer's book, Hitler's, Fur Hitler's Furies. Perhaps some of you have read this. Um, she, Wendy Lauer makes it very, very clear in her book, Hitler's Furies, that women served in German offices as well as in the concentration and death camps. Women made homes that served as havens for the men who did the dirty, rotten killing work required of them as they car carried out their Nazi oath of office. Women's active or passive complicity facilitated and legitimated the process of destruction that annihilated millions of people. Gita Sereni's book, I've, I have it somewhere on, on one of my bookshelves, but I couldn't put my hand right on it. But her book, Gita Sereni's book, Albert Speer, his battle with truth, while it was not specifically about women during the Holocaust and the Nazi Third Reich, nevertheless, it revealed that women who were married to the high level men who surrounded Hitler and who helped to plan and implement the final solution of the Jewish question avoided asking their spouses questions about what they knew and did during the years of the Third Reich. World War II and the Holocaust, in their own way, these women who were with their husbands and who socialized and had discussions over cocktails and found 
and around the dinner table with Hitler refused to discuss anything beyond family, films, weather, and other safe topics. They contributed in their own way to creating a culture of silence and avoidance that helped to make the Holocaust possible. As for Jewish women, wives and mothers, they were the ones who had to sew the yellow stars on their family's clothing and explain to their children the humiliating significance of that label. Women's narratives about the Holocaust often include a variety of gender specific behaviors and attitudes. For example, women's domestic instinct to cook and provide scarce food for their children and family members, their custom of serving their family before eating themselves if they ate at all. We know, <coughs> excuse me, that the role of women in ghettos was very important. When men were rounded up for deportation, women were forced to fulfill the traditional role of the head of the family. They were the ones who had to assume full responsibility for their family. They were the ones who had to hold them together as best they could, eking out whatever meager living, if any, they could manage. Helen Fine, a sociologist and the founding director of the Institute for the Study of Genocide at John Jay College in New York, says that gender and sex are linked to population and group survival through socialization, marriage, and family patterns and reproduction. Nazi ideology viewed women, all women, Jewish and Gentile women alike as agents of fertility. Reproduction serves to continue the group. Genocide serves to destroy the group. Thus, perpetrators of genocide must either annul reproduction within the group or appropriate the progeny in order to de destroy the group in the long run. As you can imagine, this Nazi ideology regarding women was a double whammy when it came to Jewish women. Why a double whammy? Because they were, the first is they were Jewish, and the second is they were agents of Jewish fertility. Jewish women were targets because they were Jewish, of course, but also because they were women. Annihilate Jewish women, and you thwart the rise of future generations of Jews. Until relatively recently, genocide scholars in most fields made few distinctions among victims in, of either sex or gender. Instead, they took a seemingly universalist approach, speaking of genocide victims in general. The Holocaust was long understood as an event that affected men and women very similarly. Jewishness in this view was the primary factor that elicited Nazi brutality, overriding all other victim characteristics such as sex, gender, and age. And to study differences among Holocaust victims, according to these people, was to trivialize the event. However, assuming that the experiences of men represent the universal experience of the Holocaust actually gives us an incomplete picture of the event. All genocides are gendered events. Today, gender, which is both a marker of biological sex and a set of cultural practices and beliefs, aimed at organizing relations of power between sexes is an accepted, useful, and relevant category for understanding the violence of war. We need to understand the impact of gender on genocide, or we cannot grasp the significance of an exterminatory effort. Genocide affects men and women differently. 
as my friend Myrna Goldenberg used, often has said, same hell, different horrors. So men and women went through the same hell, but often experienced different horrors. Of course, both Jewish men and women were killed during the Holocaust, and they were killed because they were Jewish. But only Jewish women were killed because they could give birth to Jewish children. Gender crimes are predominantly, though not always, committed against women. Specific gender crimes, crimes may include rape, genital mutilation, forced prostitution, and forced pregnancy. Gender crimes often are committed during armed conflict or during times of political upheaval or instability. Sexual violence is evident in many accounts of the Holocaust, from accounts of Jewish girls and women in hiding who were assaulted by their male rescuers to German soldiers conducting vaginal searches on Hungarian teenage Jewish girls before shipping them off to Auschwitz. And yet, for a very long time, sexual violence, specifically rape, was not spoken or written about very much when it came to Jewish women during the Holocaust. The question is why? Why was rape left out of many Holocaust narratives? Now, I wanna just mention to you that the publication, The Tablet, uh, which is a, a Jewish publication, you can read it online. In the April 6th issue of The Tablet, um, there is a very interesting um, essay uh, by two Israeli scholars, Esther Drobe and Ruth Lynn. And the, the title of the essay is The Missing Stories of Sexual Abuse During the Holocaust. I recommend it to you. It's, uh, it's extremely interesting and certainly uh, very complimentary um, to, in terms of what I'm saying this afternoon. One of the reasons that, the, uh, that rape was left out of Holocaust narratives, Jewish women who were raped didn't speak about it, is because for too long, women were silenced by cultural taboos, silenced by irrational shame. Another reason is that some men and Jewish men considered women, well, lesser. It was like, you know, conquering males do what they, they're gonna do. And um, the third reason was that stories of rape were left out is that too many considered rape during war and genocide kind of business as usual. You know, boys will be boys kind of situation. A fourth reason is that some scholars and military authorities simply considered rape a banal form of torture, useful for making prisoners, male and female alike, talk. Others just saw rape as another of the tools used in war and conflict to terrorize an occupied or conquered people. For sure, rape was war, was the Holocaust, was genocide's dirty little secret. Virtually all women rounded up and deported into camp were sexually abused. How so, you might say? By being forced to stand naked in front of men, by having their vaginas poked and prodded and smeared with caustic disinfectant, and by being, in some instances, forced into prostitution in bordellos, or even taken to the private homes of soldiers or some of the guards in these concentration camps. Sometimes soldiers in the Einsatzgruppen who shot Jews into the pits in the East first raped young women, then murdered them. Wendy Lauer's newest book, which is just published about six or eight weeks ago, called the, uh, the Ravine, a family, a photograph, a Holocaust massacre revealed, refers to that, refers to 
Jewish women being first raped and then being murdered um, by uh, the, the executioners tossed into uh, pits. And then there was the awful situation in which some girls and women ostensibly saved in hiding by non-Jewish rescuers sometimes had to pay their rescuers with their body. Nahama Tech writes about some of this in her book. I think um, the one in which she specifically talks about this is when light pierced the darkness, but don't hold me to that. I, I didn't check that out, but she does write about that, that uh, some uh, Jewish women to, in order to save themselves, had to pay off their male rescuers by, uh, by being sexually abused. Occasionally, a Nazi-appointed Jewish governing council in the ghetto, the Judenrat, had to furnish the Nazis with pretty young women to prevent, at least temporarily at least, the Jewish population's deportation. Sex was a means of survival. During the Holocaust, women suffered, and they suffered because they were women. Women suffered inside and outside the Nazi concentration and death camps, inside and outside the ghettos. Both Jewish and non-Jewish women suffered, even if one might say they suffered unevenly, by which I mean to say that the Nazis intended to destroy all Jewish women. Well, that was not the case when it came to non-Jews, whether women or men. If you want to read more about all of this, I recommend this book of Sonia uh, Hedgepath and Rochelle Seidel, um, Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust. This is an excellent collection of essays um, that, again, have more to say about much of what I'm talking about this afternoon. The essays in their book describe experiences of forced sex, sex for survival, prostitution, sterilization, abortion, and general sexual humiliation. It adds greatly to what is known about the lives of Jewish women during World War II. Now, it's very interesting. Gloria Stein, Steinman, a, a lifelong uh, feminist and commentator, contends that, and I'm quoting here, Holocaust horrors suffered by males and females alike have been rightly memor memorialized in histories and museums, but the sexual violence suffered by females has rarely been recorded. Perhaps Diamond said we would have been better able to prevent the rapes in the former Yugoslavia and in the Congo in the 1990s, in Rwanda, in the 1990s, in Congo in the 1990s, and even up to our own time. If we had not had to wait more than 60 years, 60 years, to hear the truths that are anthologized in uh, Hedgepath and Seidel's book, Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust. Sexual violence is a keystone of genocide. You might like to take a look at a recent book that I edited, which was published by Seton Hill University, um, which is called, and this was published in 2020, Women, the Holocaust and Genocide. The essays cover a variety of topics about women and genocide, including women as perpetrators and victims, women as rescuers and bystanders during the Holocaust, but not just during the Holocaust, during other genocides too, for example, the Armenian genocide, the genocide of the Herero and the Nama in German Southwest Africa, and the genocide in former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. Zoe Rax Waxman, a historian and feminist scholar at Royal Holloway College, University of London, believes there is still significant resistance against the study of sexual violence against Jewish women in the Holocaust. Waxman insists that historiography of the Holocaust still offers a relatively male perspective. 
her 207 book, 2017 book, Women in the Holocaust, A Feminist History, sets out to reveal the gendered hierarchies that existed, at, uh, that existed in all forms of persecution during the Holocaust. She believes that a great deal, this is Waxman now, believes that a great deal of research on sexual violence during the Shoah, during the Holocaust, remains to be done. Now, let me just say a word about women and resistance. You know, one may regard as active resistance anything that Jews did during the Holocaust to prolong their lives for another moment since it disrupted the murderer's main goal of exterminating the Jews. From the value standpoint, there's no difference between an action taken by a mother who after great effort obtained a few potatoes and made soup for her, for her family and a girl who fled to the partisans. The mother too may have had an opportunity to escape to the partisans, but passed it up because she had to look out for her family, maybe her parents, her children. The Light of Days, this is a, a, a recently published book. It's, it's called The Light of Days, The Untold Story of Women Resistance Fighters in Hitler's Ghettos, tells the story of young Jewish women and teenage girls all over Poland who transformed Jewish youth groups into resistance factions and who helped build systems of underground bunkers, paid off the Gestapo and bombed German train lines as the Nazis destroyed their communities and families. Almost anyone who engaged in actual warfare against the Nazis and their accomplices during the Holocaust was expressing a choice, accepting active death in resistance against the oppressor rather than passive death, that is in a gas chamber. Jews could either ensure their, could neither ensure their survival nor win the war by fighting back, but it was an act of pride, of feeling that they had done something. The threatening thing about these actions was that many people who were totally uninvolved in the decision to undertake these such actions would pay. And often they would pay with their lives. They would be executed in revenge for what these resistance fighters did to German soldiers. In the resistance, women had an important role to play. And some of those roles were, they served as smugglers and caregivers for people who had gone into hiding. They served as, uh, or whose parents had been taken away or murdered. Other women actively participated in warfare as in the Warsaw Ghetto or in sabotage operations. They also fought in partisan groups. Deliberate active resistance was a feat of ascendancy over the Jews' grim and hopeless reality in the Holocaust. Now, what about rescuers? Were there any women? Of course there were. Many of those honored by Yad Vashem in Jerusalem as righteous among the nations of the world are women. One of the first to be honored by Yad Vashem was a woman named Maria Babitz. She was honored on March 1st, 1962, on the occasion of the newly opened Avenue of the Righteous at Yad Vashem. Perhaps some of you have walked through the righteous, uh, the Avenue of the Righteous. Perhaps you've seen the trees with the with the uh, memorial plaques in front of them, honoring people who tried to help Jews, save Jews uh, during the Holocaust. The commission for the designation of the righteous, the commission at Yad Vashem, whose task it is to review cases of rescue during the Holocaust, described, described Maria Babitz, a Polish Catholic, as an old lady, short, of simple background, a real babushka. When Mina Ospo was killed in Rovno in November 1941, Babitz, her former nursemaid, 
despite the enormous risk to her own life, took in Maria Osipov's daughter and raised her as her own. The girl and her father, father fought in the Red Army. They both survived World War II and the Holocaust. They were the sole survivors of the entire family. Everyone else was murdered by the Germans and their Nazi collaborators in Poland. After the war, the end of the war and the Holocaust, Maria Babbitts emigrated with them to Israel, where Maria's extraordinary deed of courage and compassion was brought to the attention of the newly established Yad Vashem. There are many stories of women from all countries of Nazi-occupied Europe who during the Holocaust risked their lives to help Jews during their time of extreme need. Michael Fayer and Eva Fleischner in their book, Cries in the Night, deal entirely with female rescuers during the Holocaust. A Polish nun, Matilda Gerder, a German social worker, Marguerite Sommer, a Slovakian nun, Margit Swatka, and three French Catholic lay people, lay women, Germaine Riviere, Marie Rose Genest, and Germaine Bouquet. One could say that Cries in the Night is a book about light, light that pierced the darkness that was the Holocaust. These seven women, like so many women and men who tried to help Jews during the Holocaust, did not have the benefit of theological training, but they knew what was right and they did it. Much like another woman named Magda Trachme, wife of the Protestant pastor of La Chambon, a small village high in the mountains of South Central Western France, who also did what she could to help Jews during the Holocaust. For Madame Trachme, it started with small gestures, opening her door and welcoming, welcoming a German Jewish woman into her, her home. Magda Trachme possessed the qualities of heart and spirit that enabled her to welcome the stranger, feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, and above all, to resist the oppressor and stand with those whose lives literally depended on her. Those are not necessarily feminist qualities. They're human qualities that we should all try to develop and make real in our lives, whether we are women or men. In Notes from the Warsaw Ghetto, Emanuel Ringelblum, the renowned historian who documented the Warsaw Ghetto, singled out Jewish women for praise. He spoke glowingly about the role of Jewish women in the Warsaw Ghetto. And I think one can apply his comments to women generally during the Holocaust. Still, despite this call for recognition of women, Holocaust historians and scholars did little or nothing about this for decades. When John Roth and I published our book, Different Voices, Women in the Holocaust, we wanted to draw attention to the particularity of women's experiences during the Holocaust, not because women's voices were clearer or better than men's, not because we thought they endured their suffering in a manner superior to that of men, but because we wanted to let women speak for themselves. We wanted to allow women's memories and scholarship to illuminate the history and memory of the Holocaust. And in doing so, we wanted to learn more about how Jewish women went through one of the harshest events of the 20th century. We wanted the experiences, the reflections, and the scholarship of Jewish women to become familiar to all of us, scholars, students, teachers, the general public, as that of their more widely published Jewish male counterparts. And we wanted to rescue their voices so that all of us could hear, could hear those voices 
and learn from those voices, not just for the present, but for the sake of the future. Now, I just will make a, just a, a very short uh, comment about um, the Holocaust and memory. And I just will remind you, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, to please put your questions in the chat. And uh, I think either Michael or Danny will moderate the chat and we'll be, I'll be delighted to engage with you in discussion. Let me just make a kind of closing comment about the Holocaust and, um, as a dominant memory in the field of genocide studies. I think it is dominant and I think it should remain dominant when it comes to genocides generally. And, and I'm convinced about this for the foreseeable future, even though there have been other genocides since the Holocaust. Why do I believe this? Not because of the number of victims, not because of the proportion of that number compared to the whole group the Nazis defined as Jews, and not because of the brutality and sadism of the Holocaust. It should remain dominant, at least for the foreseeable future, because the Holocaust was a global event. The Nazis aimed to annihilate everyone all over the world they defined as a Jew, men, women, and children, young and old, rich and poor, religious, non-religious, and atheist. The annihilation of the Jews was the central issue for the Nazis because the Jews represented all they opposed, liberalism, democracy, humanitarianism, collective morality, and so on. So on. The Holocaust was a genocide motivated by an unpragmatic, irrational, and fanatic ideology. Of course, ideology can be found as a motivator in other genocides. But the genocidal project to annihilate the Jews was reinforced within a civilization and by a dominant Christian society, populated, influenced, developed, and driven theologically politically, socially, culturally, and intellectually by Roman Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox Christianity, by Christians who had been informed, deformed, and nurtured by centuries and centuries of Christian teaching and preaching of contempt for Jews and Judaism. This is not insignificant historically, nor is it insignificant to me personally as a believing, practicing Roman Catholic Christian teacher and scholar of the Holocaust. Thank you. I was saying in the wonderful conversation myself before I unmuted myself, thank you very much, Carol, for a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, let me suggest one other thing that um, in an otherwise thoroughly comprehensive picture, women were a larger percentage of the Jewish victims as well, uh, most particularly because they were women, and that is that women and children were separated from men at Auschwitz. And also the Jews could not imagine that the Germans at the beginning, that the Germans would attack women and children, and therefore many a Jewish man escaped, leaving behind his wife and his children, not to abandon them, but merely because he thought he was in a more precarious position, and consequently his wife and his child might be and would be safe. So we have to take that into consideration in looking into the whole situation of women. Let me ask a, a, a question that uh, Jeremy Lazarus has posed to us. Do you think the concept of gaze aversion, where there's been reluctance to see, prevent, and treat child abuse and domestic violence, may be one of the factors that caused these horrific stories to be suppressed and not having equal transparency in scholarly and other works? I'd say I, I missed the first part of it. You, you kind of it's, mushed it, in a little it's bit. It's called, do you think that the concept of gay, uh, gaze aversion, G-A-Z-E 
aversion, okay. averting your averting your eyes where there's been a reluctance to see, prevent, and treat child abuse and domestic violence may be one of the factors that cause these horrific stories to be suppressed or not, ha or not having equal transparency in scholarly and other works. Well, let me say, uh, I, I'm not sure I can answer that question, but I do think that, um, I'm sure there was some averting of one's gaze, but I also think that uh, let me say as a woman, um, and as a woman in an institution where women are not always, uh, our views are certainly not taken into consideration. I think Jewish women, uh, I think they were inhibited by, uh, by cultural and religious um, inhibitions about, you know, talking about issues that were so personal. And there were, as I understand it, and Michael, you or others here could, could, um, could perhaps speak to this uh, uh, more, um, uh, more directly, but there, there were, it seems to me, some uh, orthodox or ultra-orthodox views about women that, you know, what must be your fault? Why didn't you take the measures that you need to take to protect yourself? I mean, I'm, I'm more inclined to think it wasn't that, that scholars wanted to avert their gaze. They just didn't think it was important. Well, they and, also, women, uh, and women were inhibited from talking about these issues. They also were, and you and I remember this at conferences, they also were afraid that it would dilute from the Jewishness oh, ab absolutely. Of, of, the, of the experience. We heard at the beginning, even very fine scholars, who said they were killed because they were Jews and the like. That's right. But one of your achievements has been to, differ, to make us understand we can't, uh, and look, male chauvinist pig that I am, I, I'm going to say this, <laughs> absolutely. We cannot understand the Holocaust without understanding the distinct situation of women, Jewish women, in the Holocaust. And to pursue our scholarship without doing that is to neglect a very, very significant area, which teaches us an awful lot and tells us what has really averted our gaze. I'm going to turn it over to Danny because I have to go to a funeral and its timing was not in my control. Thank you, Carol and Danny, you're thank gonna you. take over and I appreciate it very much, thank you. Thank Michael, you. thank you for joining us today. I do really appreciate it. And um, Carol, we just, we do have time for a couple more questions. Um, you, know, uh, you know, from your perspective as a, uh, as a practicing Catholic and uh, a Holocaust scholar, uh, it's very interesting what your view would be. Leslie Baum, uh, one of our viewers, asks, uh, what common characteristics do these Christian and Catholic saviors or the rescuers have that the great majority of their people did not? That is, that is a great question. Uh, let me refer you to um, a book by David Gushi, G U S. H E E David Gushi, who is an evangelical Christian scholar, and his book on uh, righteous Gentiles during the Holocaust, he tries to look at precisely those issues, like what were the characteristics, the teachings, the formation that they had that they were able to, if I could say, transcend, overcome, ignore never pay attention to what we know has been, I say this shamefully, um, centuries of teaching and preaching of contempt for Jews in Judaism. Um, I, I made reference to Eva Fleischner and in her book in which she, she speaks about uh, one of the French women, um, Germaine Bosquet, I think it was, she talks about uh, this woman, this French Catholic woman who saved Jews, talks about how she never really was taught in catechism or 
her priest in her village never was anti-Jewish, never preached, whatever, that her mother was always open to welcoming anyone, regardless of, I would say today, you know, gender, race, religion, whatever. Anyone who came to their home and needed help, Jermaine's mother was open. And she said that influence was the predominant influence for her. David Gushi, uh, David Gushi says in, um, uh, in, his, in his book, he talks about um, the teachers that some of these people had and how they taught about the Hebrew scriptures and what they had to say about the Psalms as prayers. So yeah, that might have uh, that might have had uh, a tremendous influence. Um, Joe Marks asked, "Do you think the silence of Pope Pius the Twelfth about the Holocaust was a help or a hindrance to the Jews?" Somebody was going to ask a question. Now you know that I think it was a hindrance. That's 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 not even a question for discussion. Of course, it was a hindrance. And uh, you know what? Uh, Actually, tomorrow night I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be listening in on a conference, uh, a a seminar that Robert Ventresca, who is a Canadian Catholic scholar and expert on Pius XII, is going to be talking about. Uh, gaining access to these opened um, archives that were opened by Pope Francis, and then they had closed them again because of the of the pandemic. Well, the archives weren't closed, but Italy was closed uh, because of the mm-hmm. pandemic. But of course, I think that Pius the Twelfth, uh, his not speaking out clearly, uh, was a hindrance. You know, what, one last question I, I'd like to ask, and it, it's, I think I read about the, uh, this woman or, or some women in the resistance in France, Jewish women. It came out recently, a few months ago, uh, that um, they were part of the resistance. And what they would do is they would go and find German soldiers. They would seduce them and, and murder them. So here, you know, here you have some, you have a situation that's almost, that's very different as it's using uh, um, their, their gender, their femininity as, as a weapon. I don't know if you've heard of this or, or no, care to no, comment I, about that. No, I, I have, although I, I have to say, I haven't done much research on that, but there's, a, there's a, uh, an NPR um, uh, series it's not called World at War. I think it's called The World on Fire or something like that. It's about Poland. I mean, perhaps you've seen yes. this where the, the now, she's not Jewish. I think she's Helen a Catholic, but, yeah. you know, she kind of, uh, sedu- I don't know if she sexually seduces the man. I, I can't recall, because but she, she definitely tries to seduce German soldiers and then they kill them. I mean, it's, yeah, it's... Um, you know, it's, uh, it, I mean, I guess it, one could say uh, it cuts both ways. And, um, but, yeah. Are you still finding uh, any, uh, I mean, you mentioned earlier in your talk, are you still finding any resistance to, um, even today, to, to looking into um, that as the aspect uh, in the camps or, or hiding and hiding of what women had to face that particular, the particular woman's journey um, or experience during the Holocaust. I, I think that it is less so today, but I also think that women are much more assertive today. And, uh, you know, in terms of the scholarship, I mean, there's of course work going on um, there's a woman I know, a scholar at Yad Vashem by the name of Nahama Sheik. And she has written about uh, women in Auschwitz and the sexual violence and abuse that they went through. I mentioned the two um, Israeli scholars, um, Lynn and Dwar, who have, you know, asked the question, why are sexual, uh, the uh, violence stories, rape, and why has it? Why have they not been told? Uh, I think this book that uh, uh, Sonia um, Hedgepeth and Rochelle Seidel 
that book has had a, a, a tremendous influence on, uh, you know, and I mean, there's so much evidence now that I, I, I think that uh, scholars who are women who are writing about, and men, I mean, there are some men who have, who also have written about this. I just think they, they push back when there's resistance. Um, but no, that, that, that's great and it's very important. And also I do want to, you know, I read an article in the New York Times recently about, uh, with, you mentioned the couriers and the women in the resistance in right. Poland. You know, that's the other side of the coin that is just now really being told. And, you know, you're, I'm so glad that you were able to be with us today and give this talk because those are two sides of the coin of, about women's role and, and women's experiences during the Holocaust that really uh, are just now really being told and, and having an accent uh, put on them. So I do want to thank you for joining us. Well, you know, thank you. And let me, just before we, we sign off here, I do want to encourage uh, those who may be in the audience who are a part of the discussion today. Um, if you're a teacher and you want to teach about the role of women during the Holocaust, um, there, the, the four resources, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, Yad Vashem, the Shoah Foundation, and the U.N. Outreach Program. They have wonderful materials uh, to help. So does Facing History and Ourselves. It's another uh, group that you may be uh, familiar with. So, uh, and if there's anything I can do or can share anything with you, I'd be happy to do it. But thank you for inviting me to be part of this. And I hope that your well, audience has learned something. <laughs> it was our pleasure. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. And uh, everyone have a good evening. Carol, thank you so much. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you. And